If you didn't know it already, we have a celebrity in the house. <laughs> well, we have two celebrities, actually. And it's my uh, esteemed pleasure to introduce the first one. And that is our secretary, David Scorton. Secretary Scorton is the 13th secretary, and he came on board uh, this month in, in uh, 2015, July 1st. And as I recall, we were all out on the mall making that great big uh, Smithsonian star, if you remember that. Some of you are around then. Um, and he was able to join us right in the front, so we're happy to have him here today. Um, Many of you know his background as a cardiologist, as a, an administrator, as president of universities. Um, you know that he occasionally um, shows his musician background by playing the jazz flute. He's played for us a couple of times, and I tell you, he's really good. And uh, he also, way back long, and you may not know this, was um, the co-host of a weekly program at the University of Iowa called As Night Falls, Latin Jazz, uh, on their public uh, FM station. Um, we're so pleased to have him here, and I'm really pleased that he's going to introduce our guest speaker on this signature event of uh, the library's 50th anniversary. David? Thanks, Nancy, and good afternoon, everyone. You can just imagine what a fabulous musician I am if I'm here with you today. Yeah. <laughs> now, if I was any good, you'd be paying tickets to see me, but that's all right. Well, thanks, Nancy, for that introduction. And Nancy, thanks for all you do for us every day, every day. Nancy. Nancy's one of my heroes, and in a few minutes, I'm going to be introducing another one of my heroes. So it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the renovated Freer Gallery of Art for the Information Matters Lecture given today by the inimitable Dr. Carla Hayden on the timely and ever more important vital topic of diversity. I've always believed diversity to be central to this shared endeavor we call the United States. It is who we are, embodied in our national slogan, E Pluribus Unum. As is spelled out in the American Library Association Policy Manual, and I quote, libraries can and should play a crucial role in empowering diverse populations for full participation in a democratic society. See, you ought to read that policy manual more often. It's pretty cool. <laughs> the Smithsonian strongly supports diversity, not just in our 21 different libraries, but at our 19 museums, nine research centers, numerous education programs, and everywhere throughout the institution. There are a couple of reasons why diversity is so important, both to me personally and for us as an organization. First, a variety of perspectives makes us a stronger and more intellectually robust institution. Author Professor Scott Page identifies that kind of diversity as what he calls cognitive diversity, the difference in how people think. Its advantage over homogeneity is that it creates what Professor Page calls diversity bonuses improved problem solving, better predictions, and more innovation. That kind of diversity clearly benefits us all. But no less important is the more usual conception of diversity, different backgrounds, genders, ethnicities, and religions. This type of diversity is absolutely key to fulfilling our mission of the increase and diffusion of knowledge. By representing the face of America, we can better captivate, teach, and inspire everyone. Our new strategic plan aims to engage and inspire more people where they are with greater impact by the year 2022. To do so, we must invite everyone to the table. 
we must more accurately reflect the audiences with whom we want and need to engage. It's why we actively seek out and recruit a diverse body of talent all across the institution. It starts with museum leadership, research center leadership, and proliferates through all levels of the organization. We have also created museums like the National Museum of the American Indian and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. The exhibitions and programming at those museums help to redefine and to retell the American story in a more inclusive and therefore more accurate way. When we haven't had adequate space or resources to create entire museums, we have created pan-institutional centers like the Asian Pacific American Center and the Smithsonian Latino Center. An important project taking shape now that you may have heard about is the Latino Center's forthcoming Latino gallery in the National Museum of American History. It will serve as our focal point for Latino scholarship, connecting programs and exhibitions across the institution's museums and research centers. An important aspect of American life where I believe we have not adequately done our job, at least in a comprehensive way, is the extensive contributions women have made to the nation. Those stories have been peppered throughout our museums, told through some of the 155 million things in our collections. Some are on display, like the spectrograph at the Air and Space Museum, used by pioneering astronomer Vera Rubin to analyze galaxies. It would lead her to hypothesize the presence of a mysterious substance that fills the universe known as dark matter. Other iconic objects are not currently on display, like the rosewood and ivory gavel in the American History Museum, used by Susan B. Anthony to chair women's suffrage conventions a century ago. That's why I'm so enthusiastic about one of our newest projects, the American Women's History Initiative. This pan-institutional effort will help expand our representation of women's rich contributions to society, both at our museums, with an initial exhibition that will travel the country, and through many other programs. It will bring American women's history to life in three key ways. First, it will amplify the voices of women across all the museums and parts of the Smithsonian through our collections exhibitions, and the good work of our curators. It will reach a diverse and international audience with a digital first strategy. And it will empower and inspire people from all walks of life through public and educational programs. Well, before I finally introduce and welcome Dr. Hayden, allow me to tell you one such story of an accomplished woman who I don't believe has gotten the recognition she deserves. We gather today here in the Meyer Auditorium as is often the case, we don't necessarily know much about the person behind the name on a monument, building, or venue. In this instance, the auditorium in which we sit was named for Agnes and Eugene Meyer. Together, they owned the Washington Post, which they passed on to their daughter, Catherine Graham. Agnes's story is particularly fascinating. She was a pioneering journalist, a prolific writer, and a civil rights activist. She lobbied for integration, expanded social security benefits, and an end to racial discrimination in employment. She promoted the creation of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and federal aid to education. In fact, LBJ said that Meyer was more influential than anyone on his educational policies. Museums, archives, and libraries keep these stories of diversity of hidden figures like Agnes Meyer. By expanding the breadth of stories and diversifying the voices that tell them, we can breathe new life into these stories. We can make them resonate with new generations. And thanks to the Smithsonian Libraries and all the work they continue to do for us and for the American people as they celebrate their 50th anniversary this year, to you I give thanks. I also thank the other co-hosts of the Information Matters Lecture, the Smithsonian Archives, and the Office of the Chief Information Officer. And thanks to this wonderful group of professionals with us here today to hear from our esteemed speaker, and as I mentioned, one of my heroes, Dr. Carla Hayden. Dr. Hayden's very distinguished career began as a library associate and children's librarian with the Chicago Public Library. 
She worked in various capacities at Chicago's Museum of Science and Industry, the University of Pittsburgh, and of course, Baltimore's Enoch Pratt Free Library, where, as its CEO, she was named the Librarian of the Year by the Library Journal. Dr. Hayden was nominated by President Obama to be a member of the National Museum and Library Services Board, and in September of 2016, she was sworn in as the 14th Librarian of Congress, the first African American and the first woman to serve in that capacity. It is my distinct personal honor to welcome the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you and good afternoon and thank you, sir. Secretary, um, for that introduction. Special thank you to Nancy uh, for inviting me to this celebration. It's truly a milestone. 50 years of service and support for the Smithsonian Institution. You deserve a hand for each other. How many, how many of you are actually um, Smithsonian Library staff members? All right. <laughs> And we have guests and um, visitors and just someone I have to give a shout out to that's known me for almost those 50 years that you've celebrated, Miss Ann Weeks, uh, my colleague <laughs> from Chicago. The uh, being able to be here with you um, is special for me because I had the opportunity to have, and I want to share with you some memories of my own about the, with the Smithsonian Libraries. In the early 80s, I was working at the Museum of Science and Industry, it was noted. And I noticed that my dissertation topic, uh, serving young people in museums, I was, I needed to do some research. And I contacted, um, Miss Catherine Kitty Scott at the Smithsonian Libraries to start out, and I came to DC. And I don't know if any of you remember Miss Scott, but she was quite a character. And she, however, kind of warmed up to me and took me in and, and directed me. Uh, and that's where I first got introduced to the Smithsonian Libraries. And I went on and traveled the country, um, going to various museums and doing a survey of how museum libraries serve young people. Do they let them in? What are the requirements? And then fast forward to right now, I have the pleasure and honor to work with Nancy and well, Nancy, do they know who your husband is? <laughs> In case you don't know, uh, well, now everybody will know, uh, Nancy's husband is Mr. John Cole, who is this distinguished um, historian at the Library of Congress. John is one of the few people that if you ask a question about the Library of Congress, he'll say, Oh, I think I can find it in one of my books, meaning his eight books about the Library of Congress. Uh, he started the uh, National Book Festival. He was the head of the center uh, for the book and really was instrumental in getting the Library of Congress to reach out and be more accessible and to signify uh, what the combination of diverse collections can be when you think about a diverse audience and users. Now, working with my colleague, the secretary here, we, I've learned I've been in DC working for a little over uh, a year and a half. And I know that there are gangs in, um, that's G-A-N-G-S, gangs in Washington. So there's a new gang in town. We call ourselves the Gang of Three. Uh, you're a secretary, 
David Ferriero, the uh, National Archivist and Librarian of Congress. And we have started uh, meeting together and we engage in very friendly uh, historical and cultural one-upsmanship. <laughs> and it's wonderful. The next meeting is gonna be at the archives. David, and then David has the next. So it's the two Davids and Carla, right? First woman, so that's really, there you go. So here we are. So I invite, um, the main goal though, before I tell you what happened, uh, more full disclosure. Uh, the main goal though is to recognize that millions and millions and millions literally of people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, all abilities, disabilities are coming to our institutions. And when you combine those three, we hold collectively the nation's treasures and heritage, uh, intellectual, popular culture, all of these things we hold together and we should work together and not be totally in competition. The only competition we should have is how we can attract and engage more people to use our collections. So that leads to the first meeting, so I said I would host it, a luncheon at the Library of Congress. The best thing, someone said, Carla, what's the best thing about being Librarian of Congress? And I have to say it's working with the staff members. And I know you feel that too, the curators and the librarians and all the people you work with. So what happens is we pull out the good silver and you know what that's like. <laughs> at the Smithsonian, you all have it literally, good silver, you have it, right? So when a visitor comes, so we're thinking, so we do research on secretary, we knew all about his jazz background, right? I'm a librarian because my parents were musicians and so I know how that, how you end up in another profession <laughs> when you have, <laughs> limited talent, right? So he, that we have Smithsonian, he's jazz, and then David Ferriero is an opera buff. So music department, we're just out. We just bring out box hair and Mozart's hair and the, 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 the scores, Leonard Bernstein, we have his archives, we bring out just you know, just everything. The first opera ever written in the world, any time. And we have this wonderful, wonderful librarian who's a um, musicologist. And the f wonderful thing about him is he knows jazz and opera. I mean, he is truly that. So he was able to put out all of these treasures. So you have Ferio looking at all the opera stuff, even photos of these opera singers that David Ferriero was like, wow. And then he slides into jazz with something by, um, who was it, Jelly Roll Morton, who did an opera kind of thing. And then the jazz for your David. By the time this young man finished, I looked over and saw your secretary talking to him rather intently. Then I saw your secretary pull out his business card. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, maybe he wants to do some more research. Ah, uh, no. Luckily, uh, the young man now has a raise. <laughs> and I convinced him that he would be of more value to the Library of Congress. But what was so wonderful was to have the Secretary of the Smithsonian interact with one of our reference librarians and have that appreciation for his knowledge and that. And so, we are doing things together to um, engage not only um, the, the scholars and the researchers, but more with the younger generations and diversity. 
you know that the archives has um, an overnight where uh, Mr. Ferriero, after the young people sleep by the Constitution, talk about one-upsmanship. <laughs> what? I don't know, you'll let them get in the plane for the Wright brothers or something, I don't know. So we're thinking, but we have the papers. <laughs> David McCullough, so, so he, and then he makes pancakes the next morning for the children. So we said, okay, what if they could have in the, the night before, maybe they sleep at the Natural History Museum or do something like that. They wake up, he can do the pancakes in the morning, but the Library of Congress would then have them for macaroni and cheese <laughs> because that's Tom, we have Thomas Jefferson's original recipe for that in his own hand when he went. But looking at ways that we can work together because the goal, when you think about diversity, and so many times we, we limit what we think about in terms of diversity. We think it's more, it starts out with some of the more obvious things, but when you think about the fact that we have the most diverse set of users, I think you could imagine, from your curators to your, your scholars, your award-winning Nobel Prize winners, all of these serious researchers in your subjects in 21 libraries, when you think about that, advocacy groups, think tanks, I was listing of those, students, K through 12 teachers, very important, lobbyists and hobbyists and enthusiasts, people who, there are people who are researchers and, and, and get in depth about stamps, but then they're stamp collectors. So you have the, ca and then you have the casual visitors that are just coming in and you, we want to engage them and as I think it was James Joyce, and I'm going to, as a librarian, check on this. Somebody could Google it, who said, when you open the doors and you think about it, here comes everybody. And they're coming to us physically and virtually. And they're coming with all types of needs. And when you look at diversity in its broadest sense, we are challenged in many ways, prioritizing. Uh, we have, of course, the technology aspects. Um, we have diversity right here, uh, generational. Uh, there was a staff meeting recently at our library with digitizing and we're doing and metadata and all of this, right? And then someone mentioned that there are staff members that are still very tied to um, was it word perfect? No. <laughs> yes. And Roswell is like a different generation. He's, what? <laughs> um, and we recently published a book on the card catalog. It's become a kind of cult thing, a, a bestseller. It's sold in, you know. we had a young man that came in to do a, a media thing on it and he, He's about 26 and he's taking the photos and he's doing this and we still have the card catalogs in the lower levels and they stretch from you know, miles. And he's doing this and then afterwards he turns it off and he says, so what do you do with it? <laughs> and we said, well, you pull the drawer out. And then he looked at it and he did and he said, now what? <laughs> and it was such a moment to realize that he was serious, he wasn't joking. And so you're in staff meetings and you're thinking of seniors who are enthusiasts, genealogists, uh, family histories, but they need to use our um, resources and so we're doing all this about digitizing, but what about the people who are, um, not as tech savvy, how do we do that? Uh, people who have uh, different languages, different uh, ways of processing information. Some people are more visual, other ones are more text heavy. All of these things, just thinking of the diversity 
uh, in its broadest sense, can be exciting. And it is something that the Library of Congress is looking to museums as institutions that have really been able to address diversity in so many ways. So the Library of Congress is planning traveling exhibitions. Uh, it did it before with an 18-wheeler. And so the plan is to have these mobile units going into communities and helping them access the collections and actually having things that they could um, use in their communities. We are looking at expanding the visitor experience in the Thomas Jefferson Building. The Library of Congress doesn't have a treasures gallery or anything that brings out our greatest hits. Also expanding our offerings for young people. One of my favorite letters, and I've been talking about going out and doing a lot of outreach. We're doing more outreach. I'm out here talking about uh, what the Library of Congress has. I just, last week I was in Arkansas. I've been going all over the country into communities and there's a hunger uh, for people to connect with, as one lady said, that you have the real things. Like, yes, we have the real things. Uh, they are, we can vouch for. Uh, when I talk about the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated, handwrite, handwritten letters by Rosa Parks, how she feels about her arrest, the last picture taken of Harriet Tubman. We, when we have all these things and we take it out to people, they are very um, interested. And so we've started doing things like live streaming programming from the Library of Congress, live from the library. We are doing things that the Smithsonian does so well, connecting with popular culture. We started with pop-up exhibits, uh, bringing out some of the things that relate to what's going on in the world, and even right here in DC. So when AwesomeCon was here, the Library of Congress has the world's largest collection of comic books. So we brought out first edition of Superman with the Capitol Police standing right there, <laughs> right? <laughs> and all of this, um, pride. We have the Alvin Ailey archives and Jonathan Larson. And when, and I'm tweeting just like the secretary and taking people on an adventure every time we find something or something interesting. So when the young Parkland children, uh, young people sang Seasons of Love on the Tony Award, we put up right away Jonathan Larson's handwritten calculation of those days and those minutes that we have. So trying to relate what our collections are to what people are doing working with our partners. And so, one of the first times that the library went in with another institution, it was with the Smithsonian. I mentioned the Library of Congress has the last photo of Harriet Tubman. Well, together, we went halvesies with the new African American Museum to purchase the first photograph of Harriet Tubman that had been people, when you see that photo, you see what she was like coming right off of the Underground Railroad. You see that strength. We're so used to seeing her like this uh, when, when you see that. So we went halves, and the Library of Congress is using their preservation lab to uh, make sure that the photograph is taken care of and all of that, and it will be displayed at the museum and we digitized it and made copies. Those types of partnerships, one in the gang of three that we've talked about, I mentioned the, or it's so much fun, the historical one-upsmanship. <laughs> so, but we're looking at what are the connections? Women's suffrage is coming up. The Library of Congress has the papers of Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Mary Church Terrell, and the association. So when we are looking at what 
the other institution is planning, what can we do to uh, supplement, coordinate with, are there some things that we can loan? For the first time, the Library of Congress has partnered with another cultural institution to put on an exhibit where the exhibit contains items, a significant amount of items from another institution. And that institution is uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown and Baseball Americana Open. The Library of Congress has the world's largest collection of baseball cards and baseball memorabilia, Jackie Robinson's collection, the Branch Ricky Papers, the scout that really supported Jackie Robinson and, and Don Drysdale, I'm a baseball fan, Don Drysdale, Sandy Kovacs, Ernie Banks, his scouting report on Hank Aaron says something like he has promise, <laughs> right? And then there's one he had, and we blanked out the name, but all he put was can't run, can't hit, don't, don't, <laughs> don't hire. Um, so the Baseball Hall of Fame has, uh, They've lent uh, uh, Babe Ruth's cleats and all types of things. And then we partnered with ESPN and they took some of the historic data and made a, a kind of statistical thing, then and now. And then Major League Baseball gave historic um, footage so we could have one, per I always get this mixed up, Ted Williams pitching to somebody pitching to Ted Williams. <laughs> not that much of a fan. <laughs> it's limited. So you have all of this partnership and it makes it a, a more meaningful exhibit and display of the collections for the public. What we didn't figure on was the nostalgia factor. So these visitors are coming in for the all-star game and they're from all over and you see grandparents with their younger uh, grandchild talking about Harry Carey, the announcer, and hearing his voice and how it got more fluid as the games went on <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and, and just the, the, all of these connections that people are making, and that's what the accessibility, when you think about it, accessibility, diverse audiences. It's, of course we're gonna have ramps, of course we're gonna have uh, technology that allow people with um, uh, reading uh, challenges and, and uh, we have a touch area for people who are totally blind and you can take the, t all of these things, yes, we're gonna do, but what about diversity of experiences, personal preferences, and how we can make our collections more that someone can see themselves in our collections, wherever they are. We, we're showing them, and I like to say books can be windows to the world, but they should also be mirrors. And there should be something in diversity for everyone to connect to whenever we can. And that's our biggest challenge. I remember that book when I first saw myself. I, talk about it all the time, bright April, the first time as a seven-year-old I saw myself in something and what it meant to me. And going into, and we had people already in the baseball exhibit, we had an older gentleman that talked about seeing Jackie Robinson play and how it, much it meant to the African-American community. And he remembers as a child being taken to a game because of that and his father taking him to say and how everybody dressed up because it was so momentous. How can we humanize uh, people in history? Rosa Parks, the library just uh, acquired the Rosa Parks collection and to show young people in her own hand her doubts about sharing her story because she thought people would feel different about her if they knew her father left when he was when she was two how can we let people connect and so when you think about the collections that we all handle and have and how we do that i just encourage you to think about diversity in its broadest sense 
what can we do? Even things like uh, copyright no, rights. What about letting young people, and somebody said to me one time when I mentioned this, so I, I, it's okay if you think it. Um, just like we teach young people internet safety, what about when they're looking at information online and they're doing it, this generational, uh, it's not a gap, but it's a difference. They see things and they don't think about rights and, and who owns it sometimes. What if we had a, something that said see, and that means caution, hold, let's see if that's, there's some rights to that or how you download, what's copyright free and that. And that was, we were able to see that another institution, a partnership happened recently where they did that wonderfully in the Annenberg Space for Photography in LA. They had a curator, uh, Miss Ann uh, Tucker, a wonderful photography curator. She spent two years combing the photographs, prints and photographs division of the library to put up this wonderful exhibit. And all through the exhibit, they teach people about these things you can download, these things you can't, and why, and they use the C. That. There's so many ways that we can help people use our resources and also uh, think about creating themselves. We deal with wonderful, wonderful examples of creativity and intellect all the time. The Wright brothers, as David Ferriero said, well, we have the patent for the first plane and Library of Congress has their papers. Your secretary said, we have the plane. What if we do a joint exhibit? But to inspire people, to, to give them a sense of the past and connect and also let them know that they can be the next ones. They can be the ones making history. Um, I was in, and you'll appreciate this, uh, some discussion with some uh, people who have something to do with our library. And they've said, um, why are you all still collecting all of this stuff? Isn't it all gonna be digitized? Why do you need a new storage unit? Why do you need to preserve this stuff? And um, we just said, history never stops. And it's people will keep collecting. And that led to a discussion of, shouldn't we have an exhibit about collecting? and say, what do you collect? And have people think about that. So I just want to congratulate you because 50 years, though I've passed it personally, is a long time. <laughs> and to be able to grow and have the Smithsonian libraries grow and serve not only the staff and the curators, but also the general public is a great, great accomplishment. So Nancy, you should feel so proud, and everyone that works at the Smithsonian Library should feel so proud. And we want to be your partners going forward. And we won't make you cook anything, <laughs> though the library does have the largest collection of cookbooks. <laughs> and so your Julia Child exhibit and all of that, I visited, but they're, they're, we want to all work together, and so, know that the Library of Congress is your partner and together think about the resources we can have for everybody. So I know we have some time for some Q&A or just comments because I'd be really interested in how um, you think about letting the public, the general public use your libraries and I, I'm gonna open it with the, uh, I've been talking about all the treasures, large comic books, all of this stuff. And so I get a letter from a young man, Adam Coffey, eight years old, from San Clemente, California. And he says, dear Dr. Hayden, I, I heard you talk about the library and all the things you have. However, 
It's like, whoa, and this is on note paper, <laughs> printing. You require, interesting spelling, you require a person to be 16 before they can get a reader's card. I am eight. <laughs> I do not want to wait, and I can miss. <laughs> I do not want to wait another eight years before I can use your library. Is it because you think children won't be careful? We, you could make rules. <laughs> we hunted Adam down, and he said, we need to talk about this. <laughs> and I, I put it up, we put it up on our website. We need to talk about this. And he gave me his information. And so we found his phone number, we talked to his mom. <laughs> we had a conference call with Adam. We were so nervous because we're like, <laughs> this kid, you know. So we had head of communications, the education department there, our new, <laughs> Exhibit director, Dave, another David, David Mandel, we were all there and head of library services and Adam, we talked to him and he was, he wanted to know who was in the room <laughs> and all of this and um, we told him that we had plans for it and that it was very helpful that we were thinking the age, I mean, we're really outlining what our plans were. Luckily, we had some. Uh, and they were thinking that uh, at least seven years old might be it, and what would they be able to do, the Young Reader Center and all that. And he was, you know, you could hear him processing. And he, so he wanted to know when that would be ready. <laughs> and we said, we have a pilot coming and all of this. And then we, we said, well, Adam, you would be the first card holder. Well, within a few months, his parents found a way to bring him out here, and he was librarian for the day. And he inspected us and met <laughs> David Mandel, and he actually looked at proofs and drafts of the car, of the card. He had a little bow tie <laughs> and a fedora. He was cute as a button, but he made some suggestions to our graphic designer about the card and everything, and they are corresponding now. But that really taught us, and we started thinking, so what could an eight-year-old do? You know, bias is 16, and, six, and how can we uh, look at connecting with the uh, DC public schools and their one-card program, and is there some way that you could get a reader's card with the Library of Congress? when you are a junior or something like that, or is it grade-based or what is it? So that's why I was, would be really interested to hear uh, some thoughts on how we could really engage some of the younger people. Now, I think there's a, a so mic. I, I have one of the microphones. I just want to remind folks that um, we are webcasting and recording, so if you have a question, um, Alex and I will come to you with the microphone. We're webcasting. Oh, well, well, no, she had a question. David, no. David, don't worry. Librarians have questions. He's worried. He's like, hey, you call it. No, no, we got one. Secretary, don't worry. Oh, I guess it is my turn. Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming out today. It's so exciting to have you here in the Smithsonian. Um, and I really admire all the work that you do with diversity and your commitment to making diversity happen. But I was curious if you ever encounter any resistance to your plans and to making collections more open, and how do you deal with that? Well, one way is to create demand. So by sharing and talking about the collections. I mean, Adam, this little kid from California is writing in, you're talking about all this stuff, you know. So that creates uh, an actual need to at least respond. You have something that 
sometimes we would like to generate interest. <laughs> people want to use or want to do that. So you're, you're letting people know a lot of times, and that's part of the diversity thing, is uh, letting people know what you have. They don't, most people don't know what we have. And that's what we're finding out. When they say that, when we tell them all this stuff, they want to use it. So you have the demand, you have letters, you have people writing in, how can we use it? What Your hours seem not to be conducive to the general public. Um, I went to uh, one of our sister institutions, the British Library, we're planning an exhibit, one with Rosa Parks, uh, Beyond the Bus. So we'll be talking to you about that one. Um, suffrage, but also the two Georges, our George and George III. So I was at the British Library and I was talking to a researcher who was there. She's a full professor tenured at uh, like Oxford or something and she's doing a 16th, 15th century uh, Ethiopian manuscripts and she's looking. So I just asked her about how as a researcher uh, sharing space with the general public uh, felt for her in the reading room and she talked about how wonderful it was and she kind of caught that I might not be from England. <laughs> and she said, and I've been to that Library of Congress and they're not so, you know, because what she liked at the British Library, so she said, researchers have to eat, they want coffee, so some of the, the cafe and having things there for researchers and things like that and the accessibility in terms of that, uh, the same thing that a visitor would want, a researcher that's going to be there. So looking and on creating demand, looking at peer institutions and seeing what they're doing uh, is very helpful. That friendly competition, I have used the Smithsonian like you wouldn't believe in so many ways in terms of, well, look at what they're doing. Look at what the British Library is doing. Bibliothèque Nationale in um, Paris. Haven't been to visit yet, but I think I need to do a field trip. Uh, but they are doing things in terms of the public and uh, preserving it and making sure that you have the spaces for the scholars and the researchers and the staff, and also uh, be able to accommodate the general public. I have a pretty extensive background in the general public, and I know that that can be challenging and that that's in sharing those spaces, but think about how you would have different spaces, and the British Library is really working on that and doing uh, if you get a chance, that's one that's doing it really well. And then having common spaces that for the, the amenities. And then sometimes you just say, well, as one staff member asked me one time as I was talking about accessibility and opening and diversity, she looked at me and she said, you like the public, don't you? <laughs> Okay, but it was interesting to talk about, though, when I go to all the different states, those are citizens, constituents, people who will tell their congressperson, hey, the Library of Congress, so it relates to, by reaching out to the public and that, they see a value beyond uh, what you might think, and they will say it and talk about it. Too, and that's another thing. You're building a groundswell of support by opening up and finding ways to invite people to use your resources. So it can be helpful. It really can. See? <laughs> I feel so excited to actually meet you. Oh. And um, as you need I to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> but I have an idea for the gang of three. Okay. As a former news librarian, fact checker, and a retired librarian from the Department of State, 
I think it's about time that we, the, the original fact checkers, put together an exhibit, of course, with your leadership, on how to determine what is fake news and what are facts. As you know, librarians, um, we, we're we have some asses, well, I Well, we know. have, and David, you should know, and our, we have buttons and, and t-shirts that say, librarians, the original search engines, <laughs> right? So that's our thing. And we've been talking about information literacy, just like internet safety in terms of that, but also the term in, uh, information literacy for quite a while. Uh, bibliographic services, a reference, all of these things, but the, this, this is a time when I think we can help the public by saying that this is a different, this is an extension of literacy. You can learn to read your visual learner, visual literacy, all of these things, and another part is information literacy. And to talk about that's what it is, that's what we do when we do reference what's the most authoritative source, the basic thing. How do you determine? Which source do you look at for what you're interested in? And so it's bringing that up. Librarians are gonna have a day, David. I mean, we're, you know, this is what, when the people say, what do you, you go to library school? What do you learn in library school? <laughs> and then some guy asked me one time, I was on a panel and I was the only librarian and they do the introductions and then, and then he looked at me and he's, he gave me his card because he said, you have a PhD in that? <laughs> Aren't libraries going out of business? He said, but you seem bright, you know, so. <laughs> you know, you might, you know, the management thing, you know, here's my card. Uh, so it's a time for librarians and the library profession to just say, hey, you know, here we are. We, we do this. Hello. Um, my name's Erica, born and raised in DC. And the first time, yes, we're, the originals, yes. Um, the first time I went to Library of Congress, I was 28 and it was for work. And I was really nervous that they weren't gonna let me in because in DC, you don't know the Library of Congress is open to the public. So to hear you're doing these mobile pop-ups, and trust me, I'm doing my part for you <laughs> to get it out there that people should go. But to hear you're doing these mobile buses and pop-ups to engage the community across the country does my heart so much. Because you do so much, and there is so much for people to learn, to know, and just to realize they have a passion for. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. And I, I make field trips for my family now. <laughs> so we're going for Baseball Americana, and we've done other exhibits, but thank you. Well, thank you, because one of the first things we could do is, and we've already looked into it with the architect of the Capitol and all that, the signage. When you go to the front of the Jefferson Building, for instance, so we're, we're working on a master plan to enhance the visitor experience. We're taking right there. You don't see one of those kiosks or things like the Smithsonian has that's interactive, that says the hours, that one invites you to do that. You just see in tiny print, Library of Congress. So we've already, you know, of course, that's our first uh, mission, we've got our special forces, the Congressional Research Service, yes. And we want to serve Congress and the communities they serve. So that's something that we need to do right away. It doesn't even look like something that you could go into, and you need to know it right on that curb, right? The banner, you need, what about the banners? Come in, the Folger does a great job. In fact, I think I can share this. Russell is looking at me. <laughs> so one day I'm driving in the back, right, of, by the Adams Building and everything, and I see these gentlemen putting up, that I knew they were gonna be banners. I said, oh, this is great. I didn't even, I knew we needed the banners, but somebody's already done it. And so stop at the light, and then it goes up, 
come to the Folger. <laughs> Shakespeare, with the wonders of will. I'm thinking, oh, right in our backyard. <laughs> So yes, we have to do more. That's why we met with uh, Mayor Bowser and her staff and her community outreach things. How can we make, I went to their opening of their public library branch when I first got here. The young people who live in this city should really, I know they do, but appreciate what they have. And there should be some advantage to being a city kid uh, like when you live in New York, you live in other cities. They make you know what you have because you are right here. So that's why we're looking at that reader's card at 16. We just met with uh, Howard University uh, to uh, extend part of their freshman orientation, bring the students to the Library of Congress and other ways and other colleges to help them say that you have, this is part of your academic thing. So yeah, we're, we're, and then tonight, is it tonight that we have the movies on the lawn? Free movies from our register, uh, free popcorn, big screen, and, and this time we're combining, last year we did it, just the movies, it was fun, but you know, you have to wait until the sun goes down, so that's about eight or nine in summer. Now we have a concert before the film showing, and it's just open to any, anybody. And that's been to see families and they're picnicking or they're doing it right there on the side of the Library of Congress. So you'll be seeing more and more of us just, I want to see things on those buses, right? You guys do that well. And also uh, Folger is really doing it. They are doing it. But I know Michael, it's okay. okay. But just City life, that's what makes it really cool. Okay, have, have you reinstituted Sunday hours? Not yet. Yes. <laughs> Not yet, but I'm glad you brought it up. I don't know this lady. <laughs> okay. I'm another Carla. <laughs> okay, well, looks, so that's something. I mentioned the hours. We just, we're, uh, embarking on our uh, new strategic plan or rolling it out, it's more user-centered and looking at who uses us, who doesn't use us, who could use us, the hours. There are very few places that are open before 10 o'clock. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so, we don't even let people know that they could get into the library at 830. And Sundays. What about Sunday? So working with the staff and, and thinking of reinstituting that in some of the ways, that's accessibility. Being open when people can come. Everybody can't come uh, during the week and limited hours. So thank you for bringing that up. Oh, that's Anne. Hello. <laughs> um, I've always been interested in the Young Reader Center since its beginnings, and it's always seemed to me that it's had enormous potential that hasn't been realized. So what are your plans for the Young Reader Center? Now, I do know Anne. <laughs> However, you should know that I know Anne because she was head of the, all of the school libraries in um, Chicago, and that's a lot and big and I am all of this. So her whole focus has been on accessibility and, and, and connecting and everything. And so the Young Reader Center, a part of this um, plan to enhance the visitor experience in the Jefferson Building, a, a treasures gallery, new acquisitions, maybe a photograph, uh, and prints and photographs gallery because of this collection, um, opening up a more visible uh, sight lines to the reading room, and then a actual youth center. So taking it, that young reader center that was added because members of Congress had young people and said, yes, you serve Congress, but we have families. And that's how it really grew, but not as intentional as a real youth center. And so part of the plan is to put the expand the Young Reader Center to have the hands-on history, more uh, learning labs, and to put it in 
a more accessible location on the hopefully the carriage entrance and not close to the shop expanding the shop we've been looking at shops uh, and a little cafe and all of that and that's where also we have just received a wonderful gift uh, from Mr. Geppi who has the one of the largest private collections of comic books and he is uh, giving that as a gift to the library and we will have that area there too because you want to have uh, that whole thing of graphic novels and illustrated art so that's going to be the plan to have a young people's week so thank you and nancy's giving us a hook so see david we could keep going <laughs> mr secretary so don't when you get librarians together we get a little geeky you know hi I literally just graduated college in May, but I'm planning to go to library school. Um, <laughs> and I'm really glad I'm here because you're actually visiting William and Mary in September, but I'll be two in England Georges. by then. Yeah, yes. two Georges. What is your advice for someone who's going to library school? Uh, first piece of advice is something that uh, one of my advisors told me is if you possibly can if you're working or interning in an actual situation to look at some of your assignments in terms of what you're doing because you're you're getting experience on the job and you are uh, using that in your education and that's a good synergy that dissertation that i mentioned uh, is going to be about serving young people in museums, I was working at Museum of Science and Industry, and I was going to do a dissertation on young people and stereotypes and literature and all this. And my advisor said, you know, you want to graduate, <laughs> right? So you can do that later. Why don't you, since you're working, look at what you're doing? So try to combine your what you're interested in that and also be open taking some of the classes cataloging did i ever groan <laughs> for cataloging no 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 but look at try out some things and um get volunteer go and just get a sense of where you might want to start after you graduate and then keep an open mind because you never know you might say oh i'm gonna start here and you'll do that and then so just be open to possibilities and network ala best place you can go to just get a sense of everything and the people you meet at those conferences and your ala buddies are going to be your buddies all through your career sometimes you'll just see them at ala and that's uh Mr. Secretary, we just had 25,000 librarians in New Orleans. I know, picture it. <laughs> it was something. Uh, but that, you know, so your network. And then, as a person of a different generation, don't be discouraged. A lot of the people who will be possibly managing you and things like that, their computer, when they went to library school, they were taking punch cards to the central computing facility, coming back four hours later for an alphabetized list. And here you come, a digital native, talking about terabytes and bits and Instagram and oh, and just, you know, this and, okay. <laughs> Right? So a lot of it is not that you don't think about your grandparents. When you come to visit and they give you their phone, that commercial, right? So see how you can help translate it for them or, or you don't you know, realize that that's what you're, you're coming into an environment that's very careful that authoritative, remember, we're authoritative, we check, we check. That doesn't go well with the 
agile development and let's try it and see if it'll work. No, we don't do that. <laughs> so there's a reason why we have something, Mr. Secretary, called the authority file. <laughs> so, so just know that you're, it's a culture, but you, you also should know that we're very glad that you are coming into the profession because about 15 years ago, we were really worried that we wouldn't attract the millennials, or not even the millennials, what's the one after that? <laughs> that you guys wouldn't see that this is a profession that you can bring, it's an empowerment profession. You can empower people with information. And that's how we got you. So um, before we draw this to a close, I just wanted to say that when I was watching the inauguration of President Obama on TV, and I saw him come down the steps of the Capitol, and I saw Carlos sitting on the aisle in the very top seat behind the stage where the President would be going, and he reached over and gave her a peck on the cheek, and I thought, wow. <laughs> We have a powerful lady, and I'm so glad she came to talk to us today. Let's give oh, her a Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.